Since 1947, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has maintained the Doomsday Clock, a metaphorical clock that symbolizes how close these scientists believe we are to a man-made global catastrophe, a doomsday scenario. Look, because the clock was created at the beginning of the Cold War and is maintained by atomic scientists, it has long been associated with predicting how imminent the threat of a nuclear apocalypse is. Other factors could make the clock strike midnight, such as global climate change or Ozymandias teleporting a giant psychic squid into the middle of New York City. But today, it is a nuclear apocalypse that we're going to be looking at. Updated once per year, the doomsday clock has been sitting at 100 seconds to midnight since 2020, the closest to midnight that it has ever been. So that's comforting. The threat of a nuclear Armageddon has spawned countless science fiction books, movies, and video games, and the Doomsday Clock itself inspired the first hit single of Iron Maiden's 1984 album, Power Slave, entitled Two Minutes to Midnight. So, in the event of a nuclear apocalypse, would human life continue to exist, and what would it even look like? Defining parameters. Although only nine countries are known to have nuclear weapons, the global stockpile of nuclear warheads is roughly 15,000. We can't get enough of these things. Of those, about 90% are controlled by the United States and Russia. Given that there is a big difference between one nuclear weapon detonating and 15,000 nuclear weapons detonating, there is a huge range of values in play for our variables today. Recent research has modeled the effects of various scenarios ranging from full-scale global nuclear war to little tiff between Pakistan and India where they each fire, I don't know, 50 nuclear missiles at one another. Just a small little squabble over there. That scenario in particular has received a lot of attention as of late because they are the only two countries known to be increasing their stockpile of nuclear weapons rather than decreasing them. Even in this relatively small scale war in a pretty localized area, there would still be catastrophic effects worldwide. But we want something bigger. Since the majority of the viewing audience of this channel is American, howdy there, partners, it only seems fair that our scenario should involve nuclear weapons detonating in America to give you guys that personal touch. You're very welcome. For the purpose of this video, we're not interested in what sort of geopolitical events could lead to this happening or how it could potentially be prevented. <laughs> Don't care about that nonsense. But look, obviously we do hope that nothing like this will ever happen. We're just curious to examine what would happen if it does. The first days. The very first moments after the bombs drop are of utmost importance. We're not going to go into great detail about doomsday prep, but if you're genuinely interested, there are plenty of resources and weird YouTube channels that are available for you to look at. These resources often go into somewhat frightening levels of detail, but generally speaking, they tend to contain well-researched and accurate information, with the possible exception of grossly overestimating exactly how many guns a single person does need. Look, in those early days, location is key. If you happen to live in a major city like New York City, Los Angeles, or Washington DC, the rest of the video isn't going to be that important for you because you're almost definitely absolutely f***ed. So stop watching. Just kidding. Just kidding. Please keep watching. Maybe you'll leave your city. You probably won't. You'll probably be fine. Don't worry too much about it. Look, unless for some reason you have a fallout shelter or are fortunate enough to live in a building with an adjoined underground parking garage, there isn't that much that you can do. And that's assuming you even survive the initial blast and the second and the third blast. Look, it's pretty safe to assume that each major city will be struck with multiple missiles to ensure total devastation. There's also the ensuing firestorms that will be nature's way of asking us, are you sure you thought this through, humanity? Are you sure you don't know how f***ed you are yet? No, you do. The firestorms, that's how f***ed you are. You're for those that do survive being close to the point of impact of a missile, hunkering down somewhere for at least a week, but preferably two, is going to be absolutely imperative. This is also where a lot of those variables start to come into play that will make everything a lot less exact today. The nuclear blast will launch radioactive material into the air. How high it goes and how far it spreads is going to depend on the yield of the missiles and the current weather patterns. Anyone within 50 to 100 kilometers of an impact zone should expect to experience fallout 
and that radius could extend as much as 200 kilometers depending on the variables that we mentioned. The good news is that the fallout will be mostly materials with an extremely low half-life that will decay quickly. The bad news is that you'll still need to stay somewhere safe for a week or two before you want to risk going outside, and that could be a very long time if you weren't prepared with food and water. Even though most of the fallout will decay quickly, there are certain elements that won't, so you'll want to move out of the city anyway. Rural areas will be far less affected, at least by the radiation, so that's where survivors will want to travel. About 86% of America's land is considered rural, so great news! There are going to be large areas that are unaffected by radiation, but 83% of America's population lives in urban areas, so even if you survived a blast in an urban area, everyone you ever knew is probably dead. Traveling to these rural areas is also probably going to suck really hard. Nuclear detonations emit an EMP that will fry circuitry and shut down all electronics. There's no real consensus on how far these EMPs travel, and it's certainly not anywhere near as far as the fallout will land, but more than the immediate area is going to be affected. The EMPs are as completely taking down major utilities like the power grid and water treatment facilities, so you've got that to look forward to. This lack of power will also likely shut down all or most communications and broadcasting. The result will be a fun guessing game of, are we the only ones who got bombed, or is the entire world gone? Who knows? It also means there's a good chance that a lot of cars aren't going to work anymore, and even if you find one that is working, you won't be able to fill the tank at a gas station. Look, TV and movies may make siphoning gas from other cars look easy, but do you actually know how to do that? Well, that's okay. It's probably not important, as there'll undoubtedly be far too much debris everywhere to make the roads traversable by car anyway, so you'll be better off just finding a bicycle. Anyway, let's say you survive all of this and you make your way to a rural area that has a supply of clean, fresh water. That means you're in the clear, right? It's all good. Except for cities being uninhabitable and everyone you love being dead. But look, all that's left for you to do, plant some veggies and start recreating society. Right? Well, no, not so fast. You seem to be forgetting something that scientists have been warning about for decades. Nuclear winter and nuclear famine. In 1983, scientists coined the term nuclear winter to describe the effects that would follow nuclear war. Smoke, soot, and other particulates from destroyed cities would be launched high into the atmosphere, where they would stay for weeks, blocking out most of the sun's light. A lot of research was done on the matter, and estimates were constantly changing as we learned more about weather patterns and the effects of nuclear detonations. Early estimates suggested that there would be a year of no food production as a result of nuclear winter. Now, that's obviously not good, but subsequent research showed that a single year of no food production was uh, overly optimistic, and the climate effects would likely extend for multiple years, making the effects of famine far more catastrophic than previously estimated. Despite all the various research and papers being produced on the matter, in 2007 a bunch of scientists realized that there weren't actually any peer-reviewed papers regarding nuclear winter, so they got to work creating what is still viewed as the definitive research on the climate effects of a moderate to large-scale nuclear war, though New data seems to be refining some of their numbers. Yay, science. The effects of a nuclear winter would be absolutely f devastating. And the further from the equator you are, the worse it is going to be. But the core farming regions of the United States, Europe, China, and Russia are some pretty bad news. It's estimated that average temperatures would fall by about 12 to 20 degrees Celsius. And for you Americans watching, that's 20 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. You're welcome. And this could result in killing frost, reducing the growing season by anywhere from 10 to 40 days. Since China and the United States are numbers one and three for agriculture, cultural production in the world, that is a whole lot of food that is not going to exist anymore. The cooler temperatures and lack of sunlight will make agriculture difficult enough, but they would also mess with the global hydrological cycle, that thing that causes rain. Globally, rainfall would be decreased by 45%, with rainfall in these key agricultural areas falling by as much as 75%. These conditions wouldn't be expected to begin to turn around for another 5 to 10 years, and they would likely continue for at least 25 years before returning to previous levels. That is 
years, where agriculture was barely viable, if at all, and the difficulty in growing plants would have a major impact on livestock as well. On the plus side, if we were to eat all of that livestock first, it would free up all of the grain that was set aside for them so that we could eat that later as well. So yes, a big beast of animals. Unfortunately, grain only accounts for about 13% of their food anyway, so it's not quite the massive boom that we might have hoped for. All right, so let's go back to our previous scenario, where you escaped the city and you made your way to a rural area after the fallout in the hopes of finding somewhere that you can settle down and live. Are the people that already live there going to be welcoming, or are they just going to shoot you on sight? This will obviously vary on a person-to-person -person basis, but you could probably expect survival to become much more competitive rather than cooperative in the short term. Maybe the first rural people you come across are really nice people and they assume you're really nice as well, and maybe they are completely unaware of all the numbers we just talked about and how dire their situation might truly be. Unfortunately for you, we're going to assume that they have, I don't know, f eyes. They can see that the sky has been blacked out for weeks, that the mercury in their thermometers has dramatically fallen, and that the little rain their crops have received in the past couple of weeks has been filled with poisonous soot and ash. Honestly, they probably have a stronger grasp of the gravity of the situation than you fancy city folk do, and with that understanding and a priority placed on their own survival, they're likely not going to be as welcoming as you might have hoped as they load their shotguns and shout, get off my land. The years to come. Eventually, the nuclear winter would pass. Today, the levels of radiation in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are no different than the extremely low levels of background radiation anywhere else in the world. Temperatures would begin to return to normal and society could be rebuilt. The second time around, though, maybe we could build a better society, though please don't see this as an endorsement of nuclear war. We could do that anyway. We don't have to blow ourselves up first. Of course, when we say it will eventually pass, it's important important to remember that this will be decades, not months or even years. On the plus side, it will only be decades rather than, I don't know, centuries. <laughs> We're so screwed. But will it be possible for the human race to actually survive those decades, or would a nuclear war kind of be the end of life as we know it? The good news is that most experts agree that nuclear war would not result in total human extinction. Billions dead? Oh yeah, that's absolutely gonna happen. A peer-reviewed study from 2022 outlined the scenario of a full-scale nuclear war between the US and Russia. The direct casualties of the nuclear war would be approximately 360 million people which is 75% of the combined population of the two countries. The global deaths that would follow as a result of nuclear winter and a nuclear famine would be expected to exceed 5 billion people. That is a whole lot of corpses, but you know, at least it's not everybody. <laughs> For those that survived, life is gonna just, it's gonna suck. Food would be nearly impossible to come by. In the short term, there would likely be an increase in tribalism and violence as people competed over the few resources that were available. And then there's the temperature. Since it may be hard to grasp the implications of the temperature drop we mentioned earlier, as a frame of reference, the average global temperature would be two to three degrees colder than the average global temperature during the coldest point of the last ice age. Fortunately, humans already existed for about 200,000 years before the last ice age began, and they made it to the other end alive. And those idiots hadn't even invented the wheel. No thanks, I choose life. Life after a nuclear apocalypse would absolutely suck on an individual level. But for humans as a species, it would be survivable. For those that had to endure it, the experience would be hell. But for their children and their children's children, society would begin to return to much the way things have been in the past, except for uh, where the major cities used to be. The radiation would have subsided, but the immense heat from the nuclear blasts would have burned away about 50% of the ozone in those areas, so it's probably best we don't rebuild right there. That would be... Uh, It'd be more than sunburn. Thanks for watching.